okay hello uh, good evening everyone uh, i'm uh, panindra from vision 2020 the right to set india uh, so i welcome you to this webinar on uh, myopia are we short sighted in our approach so we will run this webinar uh, for an hour and uh, this webinar will provide you the comprehensive knowledge on uh, the advocacy uh, with regard to myopia and the right counseling for patients and also myopic uh, children and the management of myopia so please uh, take uh, benefit of it and this will help you in uh, relooking and uh, revisiting your practices at your hospital in our practice and uh, also help you to identify key gaps in your uh, service provision so that you have the opportunity to improve access to services and the quality that uh, you have been working on so i'm happy to introduce uh, the speakers first today so we have with uh, dr pavan kumar varcherla uh, dr pavan uh, kumar is a scientist researching on both basic and uh, transnational aspects of myopia at the myopia research lab at lv prasad eye institute hyderabad dr vishwanathan dr vishwanathan currently is assistant professor uh, at uh, allied school of optometry and also the head of the department optometry and uh, optical services also the chief optometrist at uh, myopia management clinic at shankara netral at chennai we have uh, one two more and uh, uh, so one with uh, very experienced uh, we have uh, mr reshwant sawaji he is a senior optometrist from nagpur having his center own center and uh, he is specialized in the field of contact lenses so we have uh, uh, lakshmi shinde so thanks to lakshmi uh, for actually proposing this webinar and with no time we agreed to conduct this webinar So Lakshmi is a graduate from Allied School of Optometry, Chennai, and following her graduation, she has worked at the contact lens department of Elvi Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, and she is also the CEO of Optometry Council of India, which is the self-regulatory body for optometry in India. And uh, so, thank you all the speakers. I am sure uh, you know uh, our our partner hospitals will take benefit of this also for of this session. Thank you to Vision Twenty Twenty and to. Uh... obvious for giving us this platform um i'll just uh, take a couple of minutes to say how uh, the we've come together to um, you know to propose a, a myopia white paper which many uh, have endorsed many associations and organizations have endorsed and uh, as a group when we came together i guess it all started uh, when pavan kind of told me that maybe this is something that oci should take up and do and then after that like minded people came together and then we all together wrote the um, came up with this myopia white paper and uh, because of the current conditions in terms of online lot of online education and so on i just propose uh, this talk uh, to mr panindra and thanks to vision 2020 for agreeing the uh, way that uh, the program will flow is uh, dr pawan will first uh, give a introduction about myopia and its effect uh, followed by dr vishnath will talk about the spectacle intervention for myopia and then yashwant sawji would talk about the contact lens interventions for myopia and finally i'll talk to you about the public health policies so without any further delay over to you paul a very good evening everyone hello to all those who are attending the course from india or from outside i started putting this slide with this in the go at first are we really short sighted in our approach i spent a lot of time thinking yes or actually you know maybe not then i said let's worry about this later so that's where i said i'll move on to the next slide we'll come to the first slide uh, when i conclude my talk so for today i will be talking about a quick overview of myopia keep in mind that myopia is a motion by itself i cannot complete everything in the given time so we'll keep it short and i will be running a bit quickly for the next uh, 12 or 10 minutes or so I do not have any financial disclosures, but I hold uh, research grants from the uh, government of India and through private uh, industries. I'm showing this because the work that I'm showing here are supported by or uh, one of these. So, starting with what myopia is, I do not have to go into the details, but the picture is self-explanatory. Uh, myopia is an ocular condition where the axial elongation happens due to which the outer coats of the eyeball stretch. The problem is the ocular complications, ranging from the lattice degeneration, lateral cracks, or the corneal atrophies, or to the more serious retinal detachment, eventually leading to the visual impairment. Now, apart from all this, there is also increased risk for development of cataract or glaucoma. 
I will not uh, bore you with uh, this slide to say that there, there will be 5 billion mines by 2050, 1 billion by uh, 2050, I mean the high myops, but I'm more interested to show you what's happening in the Indian scenario. So this is the uh, publication, the systematic review published uh, in the year 2020, a few months ago. If you look at these dots here, these are all the data from 1979 to about 2008. And they say the prevalence of myopia on x axis is about, let's say I keep it 10% or less than that, ranging from 2%, 2, 4, 6, and at the maximum you're getting about 12%. If you uh, change gears and see all the day from 2009 to 2020 or 2018, you see that the points push towards 25% prevalence. If you see the top two points, one published in 2016 and the other one in 2009 indicate that the prevalence of myopia in the urban school children is about 28% on an average. Now, based on this, what we did is a prediction model here. We know that the prevalence of myopia is increasing in Indian scenario, clearly, all the way from 2% uh, uh, based on the reports published in 2000 to about 35% uh, in Hyderabad in the year 2019 or 2020. We said, okay, this is what the situation is, but let's see how does it look like in the years to come. So this is the work that was majorly done in the myopia research lab conducted by the Jessim Prasilla, who's a research optometrist. So if you look at these black dots here, until one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these are seven different studies published all the way from 2000 to 2020, that's all we have. We said, okay, let's see how this data can be modeled. Is it looking like a uh, polynomial? Does it take a linear fashion? We did a lot of statistical analysis and then said that, hey, that Indian data, especially if you talk about urban population, it looks like more of a linear trend. You started off with something in 2000, which is about less than 5%. Every year, the publications are coming out and they're indicating only an increase compared to that of a previous paper. So using this, we said, let's now look at what's happening in 2030, 2040, 2050. So as you see here, we predict that the prevalence of myopia in Indian children who are living in urban cities is going to go up to 48%, which means one in two may have myopia by the year 2050 if no intervention is made. Now, let's say if you have said that, hey, everybody do more of an outdoor activity, uh, given that outdoors is considered to be protective for myopia, uh, myopia or myopia prevention. So that 48% is tending towards a drop to about 32%. Again, this is based on the model that we say, hey, what one out of two tend to have myopia if no intervention is made. But if you put them on some sort of intervention, how does the trend change? What does this equate when we say 48% uh, or whatever percent, as you see in the first column, 2000 to 2050, this is the year. And we consider population growth rate, what's the population in urban regions, what's the prevalence of myopia in each decade. If you equate this 48%, you're looking at about 64 million children to have myopia. So that's a big problem and definitely uh, this is a public health concern. Well, one bad or good thing about myopia, well, I must say it's a bad thing about myopia is once you're a myop, you're a lifetime myop. As you see here, somebody developed myopia at the age of five. I mean, it does not go away at the age of 15. You have to still wear your spectacle. If there is anything, it's only going to go worse. So given the generational effect, we also predict that the overall prevalence of myopia is going to boom in the years to come, not just 5 to 15. Because today, I may be uh, falling in the bracket of 5 to 15, but in a 10 years time, I will be between 15 to 25. So I'm myop and I will continue to be myop. The new myops will pull up. So overall, there will be a big boom of myopia in India. Not just that, let's understand there is a problem, yes. How much does the Indian children progress? Is there a really big problem? Again, this is the work done at LVPEI. We got about 7,000 myopes approximately. And we found that about children aged uh, 
uh, 5 to 15 years, progress by about half a day after every year. Now, that's not a problem. The problem is 17% of them tend to progress every year by about one diopter. And this is the cleanest possible data. Do not think that, hey, this is data from hospital-based setting. We have cleaned the data. And we said only refractive error, no other ocular complication. So we said that about 17% likely to, uh, or not 17% uh, tend to have a progression which is of more rapid. And as expected, we found that children progress much faster compared to that of the young adults. The interesting finding is here, we found that children with children or adult, whoever has high or severe myopia, tend to progress at a faster pace. If you compare the left panel versus the right side, the mild and the moderate ones as they age, the progression reduced. But if somebody is high myopia, I think that's the need for us to really be more um, urgent in implementing some sort of anti-myopia strategy because they're going to go very rapid even if you are a child, even if you're an adult, if you're high or a severe myop, the progression tends to be much more rapid. The other interesting thing, uh, which also corroborates with the findings that are reported in the literature, are that if somebody develops myopia at an early age, if you see on x-axis, we have apparent onset of myopia, age of onset of myopia, somebody develops before 10 years of age, when they become adult, they tend to have high myopia. On x-axis is the age. Y-axis, what is the refractive error when they are adults? So adults, as in here, we got about uh, uh, 18 or about. And then you see that somebody who developed myopia before five years tend to have high myopia, which is minus eight. And somebody who developed myopia at the age of 16 or above that, they tend to have only mild. Because as we know, the, the progression does not happen more aggressively in the adulthood. So age of onset of myopia is very important and that's something that we have to keep in mind in our clinics. Now talking about the uh, pathologic myopia scenario in India, we are no less compared to that of East Asians or the Caucasians. Indians also tend to show about uh, uh, complications ranging from tessellation to lattice to RD and there's about 4.3% of myopes. So another point worth highlighting is that this complication does not happen only in individuals with high myopia. The notion is, hey, only if you have high myopia, you might have ocular complications. That's a myth. That's wrong. There's evidence to show that. And this is data from 29,000 myopes. Not just this, even before there are a lot of publications that have come up to say that, hey, even in mild cases of myopia, they tend to be ocular complications and thus careful uh, examination and putting them on some sort of anti-myopia strategy is very precious. So before it gets to this extent uh, that is seen in Wuhan, where they use the physical bars to keep away the material and then maintain the arm distance to the reading material, I think it's definitely time for us to act on myopia management. So again, I'm not going into the very details of it. I will keep it short. Myopia management can be two-pronged. Number one, you try to prevent myopia. Before that, you understand the cause, obviously, but prevention is something that we have to target at the earliest possible to ensure the prevalence of myopia does not hit 48%. Number two, very straightforward. If you notice somebody with progression, the only way is put them on some sort of anti-myopia strategy. The next speakers will take you through the details of what are those and uh, how they actually function. But in a nutshell, the, the anti-myopia strategies range from outdoor activity to pharmacological management to uh, spectacle format or the contact lens uh, and so on. One point that I want to highlight is that the, the, the anti-myopia strategies did not come up like that. They have developed based on the risk factors. So again, the next speakers will take you through the various spectacle and the contact lens format, but I will highlight a bit on the environmental aspect. Uh, in terms of the optical or the uh, pharmacological management, the percentages show that about more than 50% efficacy is known uh, in various populations. Of course, we do not have much of a data from Indian scenario. Uh, the studies are ongoing. And there's one uh, publication that has come out recently to say that atropine is working in Indian population too. 
So coming to the light exposure, why are we targeting on light exposure? Obviously, there's a generational change. This picture is self-explanatory. And uh, again, uh, uh, previously, it all used to be outdoor. Now everybody is glued to the near work or the mobile phones or any of the gadgets that you want to name. Now, why outdoors is predicted? There are multiple factors. There is no single factor to say that, hey, this is the reason for why outdoors is protected. But there are a few hypotheses that we can talk about. Number one, if you're outdoors, you're not indoors, which means the light levels are too high in outdoors. It's at least tenfold high. Number two, if you look at this image here, if you're looking at a book, if you're accommodating two adapters, if you're looking at a cup that's far away, 33 centimeter away, three adapters, and it's something one meter away, that's still one diopter. Whereas if you go outdoors, the objects that are close to the eye are not there, and you're looking at something that's far away. So the equal diopter space, we call it. Meaning, if I'm indoors, I have objects coming in from different dimensions, and this accommodation that we go in. If I'm outdoors, especially in an open space, I have equal diopter space. Let's say optical infinity, my accommodation is relaxed. Not just the center, but even in the periphery, there are not any targets that can trigger the eye to go. If I'm outdoors, dopamine release happens in the eye that is known to inhibit the actual elongation. And the spectral composition, if I'm outdoors, there's more blue, and that is known to inhibit actual elongation too. Glass classrooms were built in the uh, other countries, and in few countries, they're using the light trackers, much like the fit site. Uh, not the fit side, much like the uh, Fitbit, you use it for burning your calories. There is these trackers that are available in the market, which says that, hey, you're indoors by this much amount of time, you're outdoors by this much amount of time. Sort of motivation for us to send kids in the outdoor environment. Again, various studies indicate that the uh, myopia prevention can happen if you send kids in the outdoor environment. This is x-axis. Is the number of hours spent and y axis is the incident, the risk of incident myopia. The more time you spend in outdoor environment, the less likely that the kid might develop myopia. The studies also indicate that if it's not just myopia prevention, but progression can also be controlled to a certain extent. This is the recent evidence that started to come out. So this is uh, one of the publications that we have uh, put in the current science of Indian journal. We have proposed various things that need to be considered as a public health policy, such as mandatory one hour. I think Lakshmi will take you through this in detail as part of the OCI initiative too. Now coming back, are we really short-sighted? Maybe not. I think we're doing talks. We are managing myopia in our clinics. But if you still think that we are still short-sighted, we're not looking at we are not starting the treatment, we are worried, we do not have an option. I think what we need is self-belief. We need confidence because you have to start somewhere. Nobody becomes an expert in one shot, but you will be a beginner and then you will be an expert at a later stage. Confidence is contagious, catch it and spread it. I must say it's contagious than the COVID-19 maybe. So and it's high time. Myope is also another pandemic. If you don't act now, it's going to go worse. So please be confident in managing myopia. And then let's see how we can control. But this is a mantra for you all who are listening today. Always highlight on these four M's. You have to be a master to see a patient or a kid with myopia. Master here is just understand that myopia is multifactorial. It's not just because of near work. It's not just because of outdoor. It's not purely because of that. It's the multiple factors that play a role. Number two, measure all the possible X factors. I mean, if you ask me what needs to be measured, I will list about 10 to 12 variables. But if you do not have all these instruments, get whatever you have, quantify it, and then monitor every three to four months to see if there is real progression. Do not just put them on a strategy immediately. We do have various anti-myopia strategies. The only way is do not give single vision lens. Uh, look at how to control progression. I mean, single vision lens is good if there is no progression for sure yes but if there is a progression i always say that providing single vision is the same so to conclude myopia prevalence uh, is on rise it is considered as a 21st century problem with 48 percent tending towards a myopic refractive error in india i would say this indian myopic boom that we're going to head towards 
Mahapia progression also happens in India. Do not say that Indian children do not progress. About 17% are progressing more rapidly. When I say rapid, it's one day after. Keep in mind, earlier the onset, greater is the risk of the developing high myopia. Pathologic myopia, again, Indian scenario, we are no less in terms of showing pathologic lesions. And irrespective of age, irrespective of the refractive error, pathologic lesions do occur. The conclusion is that beyond the single vision correction, the next speakers will take you there. But keep in mind the myopia mantra, master, measure, monitor, and manage. The expert said nearly 1 billion myops at risk of myopia-related sight threatening conditions by 2050. It is definitely time to act now. So that's a big man side. I want to end my uh, talk by saying that in India, if it's not now, then it will be too late. If it's not now, then when? Thanks for your attention. So next is Dr. Vishwanath, who will talk to us uh, about spectacle intervention. Thanks, Lakshmi. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Vision 2020 for giving me this opportunity to present on spectacle management of myopia. So why uh, spectacle lenses for myopia management? So no complications compared to contact lenses like redness or dryness, no side effects compared to atropine like blur vision or photophobia, and young children can easily be fitted with these spectacles. So is it Going to be, is it full correction or under correction? So Chang et al. in 2002 uh, gave full correction to 47 uh, myopic uh, children and uh, gave uh, under, uh, and he under corrected to another set of 47 myopic children by plus points on five diopters. And uh, what they found was under correction produced more rapid myopia progression and the axial elongation. And uh, in the recent uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, comprising six studies with 695 subjects, what they found was myopic eyes, which are fully corrected, are more prone for myopia progression. And also, uh, you know, uh, in com when compared to the, when compared to people who were undercorrected. So what is loud and uh, clear here, is um, under correction may do more harm than good. So what are the myopia control spectacle options available? So till 2010, traditional progressive addition lenses and bifocals uh, were tried. And uh, after 2010, special design uh, lenses have been tried. So Comet study was, uh, you know, one of the largest study uh, conducted on 469 uh, children. And uh, they gave progressive addition lenses with plus two addition uh, to 235 children and uh, single vision lenses to 234 children. And they followed after three years. And uh, a similar uh, study was conducted in 2008 on 92 Japanese children. They gave progressive addition lenses uh, with plus 1.5 addition. And after 18 months, they cross over and uh, they um, uh, followed these children for uh, three years. And what um, they presented was uh, progressive addition lenses slowed myopia progression, but the treatment effect was very small. Moving on to the bifocal lenses, uh, uh, you know, Cheng et al. in uh, 2010 and in 2014 gave executive bifocal to 48 uh, children and uh, executive bifocal with three prism basin to 46 children. And after three years, what they found was significant reduction in spherical equivalent and axial elongation. But unfortunately, because of the conspicuous line which runs across, and because it is not cosmetically appealing, these lenses were not considered further. So till 2010, whatever lenses, traditional lenses that uh, we have been trying, uh, we have been tried, were based on accommodative lag theory. And uh, following uh, 2010, uh, the 
have been developed were based on uh, Professor Earl Smith's uh, animal experiment, which was based on peripheral hyperopic uh, defocus theory, where when we correct, uh, you know, myopia with the traditional lenses, the central part of the, you know, retina is uh, only corrected, leaving the uh, periphery with a significant hyperopic defocus. Uh, you know, and what is believed is that these peripheral hyperopic uh, error uh, stimulates the eyeball to grow further. And the lenses that have been developed following uh, 2010 have been based on this concept, either to reduce the peripheral hyperopic uh, uh, defocus or to, uh, you know, induce a myopic defocus. So based on this, three novel spectacle designs were developed to reduce peripheral hyperopic defocus. And the first one had uh, this, uh, had a 20 mm central clear optic zone with plus one diopter relative peripheral power. And the second one had 14 mm central clear optic zone with plus two diopter uh, clear uh, relative peripheral power. And the third one, uh, was an asymmetric design with plus 1.9 diopter relative peripheral power. And the fourth one was a conventional uh, single vision design. And when they uh, gave this randomly to 210 children, what they found was unfortunately, there was not much of an effect in terms of uh, you know, control of myopia progression, except in the third design where they found uh, moderate uh, control in uh, uh, myopia progression in terms of spherical equivalent and axial length. So moving on to the uh, next generation of uh, the special designs by uh, Hoya and Essilor, Hoya's uh, uh, myospont lenses were based on defocus incorporated multiple segment uh, technology, which was developed with Hong Kong Polytechnic University where these lenses had a central clear optic zone surrounded by treatment zone. And these uh, multiple uh, uh, treatment zones uh, had uh, a myopic defocus of plus 3.5 diopters. And these lenses were tried on 183 children. And what they found was these lenses significantly retarded myopia progression and axial elongation. And uh, these results also demonstrated that uh, uh, you know, simultaneous clear vision with constant myopia uh, defocus would slow myopia progression. And the Teles lens by Essilor uh, was based on uh, this Hall technology, which is a highly aspherical lenslet target, where these aspheric lenslet induced uh, myopic defocus, and these were tried on uh, 167 children. Again, uh, these lenses had good uh, uh, reduction in uh, spherical equivalent and axial elongation as well. Recently, novel dot design from sight uh, glasses were uh, developed based on retinal contrast signals. And their hypothesis um, uh, was high retinal contrast signals would lead to high myopia. And these lenses were tried on uh, these myopic kids in one eye and the standard lenses were given in the other eye. And after three months, what they found was uh, the axial growth was drastically reduced in the eye, which had uh, these dot lenses. And after three months, they swapped the lenses. And um, what they observed was in the eye, which, was, uh, which had good reduction, started uh, 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 growing. And in the other eye, which had uh, uh, good control, and uh, uh, virtually stopped growing. So, and uh, these uh, results, the initial results are very promising. So this is a graph, uh, graph depicting uh, spherical equivalent reduction and the axial elongation reduction. If you look at the uh, graph on the right side is a clear winner. And um, moving on to the strategical deliberation of spectacle management, so the next question is, when do we start uh, you know, prescribing these lenses? And as we all know that younger ages are associated with greater progression, so it is better to start early. 
and it is also uh, better to wear this throughout the waking hours. And when do we call these patients for follow up? And uh, it is better to call them frequently, at least half early or uh, at least once yearly to monitor the progression. And when we fix these lenses, monocular PD and height are to be measured and uh, fixed based on that. So the take home message is do not stop with single vision lenses especially when we observe progression, consider myopia control strategy. Thank you. Thanks, Vishwa. So the next speaker is uh, Yashwant. Um, he'll be talking about contact lens uh, strategies for myopia. So hello, everyone. And now that uh, Pavan has told us everything about myopia and Vishwanathan has told us about the uh, spectacle options for controlling myopia, let's talk a little bit about contact lenses. Now, when we talk about contact lenses and myopia control, the first thing that comes to mind is orthokeratology. And that is the buzzword in India today. Everybody wants to get into practicing orthokeratology. And I don't think I need to elaborate more about what orthoke lenses are, but I would rather talk more about, a little bit more about the other options. Like you have the daytime orthoke lenses, which is not very, very common. Now, this is technically not an orthoke lens, but a regular RGP lens with a plus four ring on the front surface of the lens. When we talk of contact lenses, any contact lens which is for myopia control would always have a plus ring on the front surface or it will generate the plus ring on the cornea. Similarly, in cases of soft orthokay, these are regular soft contact lenses, which has again got a plus four ring on the front surface. And these lenses, the, the regular day wear RGP orthokay and soft orthokay, they are supposed to, worn, to be worn during the daytime. Yeah, Lakshmi? Have you changed the first light or? No, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. And if we are a little bit unlucky, if we don't have access to these specialty products, then we have our own uh, uh, very faithful soft multifocal contact lens in the Indian market for sure. And uh, the only difference being, if possible, go in for a dist center distance design with the highest possible add that also helps in controlling myopia. So let's talk a little bit about orthokeratology. The moment you mention the word orthokeratology, many cringe. And it's because of the bad experiences people have had in the past. But those designs were different. Those conditions were different. That time, the practitioners did not understand orthokeratology so well. They were not trained properly. And they were indiscriminately dispensed to the patients over the counter. As a result, uh, many of the patients did have some complications. And some of them were serious as well. And because of which ortho lenses were banned in some countries and especially in China, but understanding the importance of uh, getting into myopia control, now the Chinese government is actually helping to propagate ortho in China. And I believe the same is happening with, uh, with Russia. And there are countries like Singapore, Vietnam, UK, US, Australia, wherein ortho lenses are very, very uh, widely used. One example I would like to quote is of Vietnam. Vietnam got into um, orthokeratology about just four years back and they are way ahead of India. They understood the importance of practicing these lenses and the amount of lenses being ordered by Vietnam today is amazing. So this is where India has to reach very soon. <clears throat> so orthokeratology are nightwear lenses. So you're supposed to be wearing these lenses when you go to bed and <clears throat> they create thickness differences across the cornea. So in the center, they, they have a positive uh, pressure which compresses the epithelium. Now the lenses are not directly hitting the corneal epithelium, but always remember there is a thin tear film between the lens and the cornea, which is what we should counsel the patients. Otherwise the patients feel okay, it is directly hitting the cornea and it could be risky. So if you have a tear film, then the staining will not happen. So the positive pressure in the center and a negative pressure in the mid periphery will cause central flattening. And in the mid periphery, there'll be expansion of epithelial cells. And this is what would correct the myopia and also control the myopia. We will see that in the next slide. So it is uh, four points, uh, safe and very effective option for myopia control. It's very, very effective. If the lenses are designed very well, uh, the results are really good. Uh, <clears throat> now myopia, uh, Correction by orthokeratology lenses have been US FDA approved up to minus six diopters of spherical with minus 1.75 diopters of cylinder. So rarely you may encounter a kid who is beyond this correctable range. So if you do have kids like that and you still want to implement myopia control, please remember partial correction up to minus six is equally effective as a complete correction. 
children adapt faster because children, they lead a disciplined life. So eight o'clock is breakfast time, uh, 12 o'clock is lunch time, four o'clock is uh, your brunch time. So when, they, when a person is wearing orthokeratology lenses, they need to have some discipline and they need to sleep well at least for six to eight hours for the lenses to correct the cornea properly. Now, when we talk about sleeping with the contact lens, the first question which anybody, optometrist, ophthalmologist, parents, patients, everybody would ask is what about the complications? The complications are exactly the same as your day wear soft contact lenses. Now, today, when we prescribe day wear soft contact lenses, we don't think twice about complications. So orthokeratology, if the lenses are fitted well, it's the same rate of complications. Today's lenses are uh, made with slightly different technology. We've got complicated lates, complex lates, which actually uh, have precision uh, uh, production of orthokeratology lenses. These are called as accelerated orthoke lenses. So earlier times, you know, you needed to change one or two pairs, but now with proper assessment of the patient and proper trial fitting, the first pair that you give works for myopia correction as well as for myopia control. So that's the same pair which the patient wears it for a period of one year or a little bit more. Uh, custom design versus ready stock. The advantage in custom design is everything is under your control. So you look at the pupil diameter, you look at the HVID, and then you design the lens for best possible results. No, no doubt about that, that these lenses provide the best myopia control. The mid peripheral plus can be controlled. Now I will show you in the subsequent slide that for every diopter of myopia corrected, there is a power generated in the mid peripheral region. Now for myopia to be controlled very well, we need at least plus four to plus 4.5 diopters of plus in the mid peripheral region. Now let's say you have a patient who's got minus one diopter of myopia and comes in for myopia control. Now, when you correct this patient with a regular ortho K lens, a ready stock ortho K lens, the plus that will be generated is about plus one, plus one to plus 1.25. Whereas when you customize this lens, you can generate up to 4.55 or even beyond that. Now, as opposed to custom design lenses, let's talk about ready stock lenses. The, the advantage is everything is right there in front of you. So if the lens is not fitting, if the diameter is not working properly, you've got another diameter. If the peripheral curves or edge lift is not proper, you can just remove the lens, put another one and recheck and your job is done. You don't have to wait for the lab to design the lens and send it to your office, no. So it's much faster. The only slight disadvantage is uh, initially you have to invest in trial sets. So on the right side is my little collection of ortho K lenses in my practice. So a few tips that I would like to share uh, with respect to ortho K. <clears throat> Just one second, yeah. So the number one and number two lens, the Paragon CRT and the context lenses, most often I use these lenses for myopia correction rather than myopia control. Although context does have myopia control lenses also, the EX lens. And most often we customize the lenses when it comes to myopia, contr uh, myopia uh, control. Now the treatment zone, the average treatment zone varies between 2.8 to about 4.5 millimeters. It depends upon the myopia being corrected. Lower myopia corrections will give you larger treatment zones and higher myopia corrections will give you smaller treatment zones. So let's assume that the average treatment zone is about 3.5 millimeters. And for myopia control to be best, we need some amount of this peripheral plus to fall in the pupillary area. So let's talk about 1.5 to 2 millimeter ring inside the pupil. So which means we, we need to have a diameter, pupil diameter of five millimeters at least to have the best myopia control. So if that is not achieved, if the patient's pupil is small, then you have to customize the lens wherein you can reduce the treatment zone size and get effective myopia control. The contact lens care regimen has to be up to the mark as with, as with any contact lens. The solutions have to be good and care and maintenance has to be good. The patient needs to understand when to come for follow-up, what are the warning signs and uh, how to wear, what to do if the lens gets stuck in the eye. All those things you have to train the patient very well. I'm sorry, I'm going a bit faster. Yeah, this slide I've already already covered. Plus one diopter of plus, uh, plus power is generated for every one diopter of myopia is corrected. And plus 4.5 is required for best myopia control. Now this can only be achieved by customizing the lens on a software where an ace ferricity is generated on the back surface to add additional plus. Now, if you see in the diagram, uh, this is the positive pressure that was applied to correct the myopia. And this power was shifted here and it became plus. So if this power, let's say was minus five, this becomes plus five, okay? Now let's talk 
a bit about complications. I just want you to pay attention to three points on this slide. Point number two, daily wear soft contact lenses have got microbial keratitis uh, risk factor at 0.12% and ortho-K has got 0.14%. So it's practically the same as your regular soft contact lenses. Now, what you need to inform the patient and remember is a minus five or beyond minus five diopters of myop is four times more likely to develop myopia related complications than microbial keratitis. So we as parents, we as practitioners, we worry about contact lens related complications, which possibly will never happen. But there is a four times or five times more likelihood of myopia related complications happening in this patient's eyes. So worry more about that and counsel the patients accordingly. Now, regular RGP contact lenses, as I said in the beginning slide, if your power is exceeding, if your power is exceeding beyond, uh, one second, that's 10 minutes up. It's exceeding beyond minus six, which is the permissible limit. Then you can have the customized uh, RGP contact lens with a plus four, plus 4.5 ring on the front surface. Similarly, in cases of soft contact lenses, the results are good, but they may not be as good as your regular RGP ortho-K lenses. But for cases wherein you, you may not want to fit ortho-K RGP or uh, the lenses are not available, then you can fit these lenses and the results are decent. Presently, what is available in India is the ortho -K, uh, the OK Vision Miracle Lens, which is made by OK Vision Russia. And you've got soft ortho -K lenses made by GOV USA. And I've deliberately put my site one day, although it is not available in the Indian market yet, it is the first lens that is approved for myopia control by the US FDA. Multifocal soft contact lenses, so where nothing is available, definitely for these lenses, make sure these are center distance lenses and prescribe the highest type that is possible. You, you may have to re-refract to get uh, proper distance vision because sometimes these patients accept slightly higher minus in the center. And that's about it. I think last slides were rushed, but uh, I personally believe that it's a teamwork. Myopia control is a teamwork and the team is the patient's parents, the patient, you as an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. All four people need to get together to do what is best in the patient's interest. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing in the Indian scenario is when the optometrist cannot prescribe atropine, he's preferring more of ortho-K. And when the ophthalmologist cannot prescribe or ortho-K, he's going more in favor of atropine. That should not be the case. You assess the patient and then decide what modality would be best for that particular patient. And optometrists definitely need to get themselves trained in myopia management. And publications, especially with respect to corneal ortho K, need to increase so that, you know, the ophthalmologist, the parents, and everybody is convinced that these lenses are not risky when it is worn on overnight basis. So thank you very much. Over to you, Lakshmi. And I'll be talking about public health policies and uh, uh, my myopia control. I'd like to thank uh, Paula Mukherjee, who is my colleague, as well as Dr. Darni, who've helped me in the presentation. And before I proceed, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, name all the people who are part of the myopia task force in OCI. Uh, of course, the speakers here, that is uh, Dr. Pavan, Dr. Vishwanath Yashwant. And we also have two more people. One is Dr. Anuradha, who heads the Elite School of Optometry, as well as Dr. Rizwana, who is uh, uh, a myopia control uh, uh, specialist as well. Um, she as well as myself. So we all form uh, part of the myopia task force um, as far as OCI is concerned uh, and as far as the myopia white uh, paper is concerned as well. And we plan to make a couple of other task forces when it comes to implementation of the same. So from just a summary of uh, what everybody has spoken, uh, more close work contributes to increase in myopia, which is very clearly spoken by Pavan. He also alluded to outdoor activities, reducing the incidence and prevalence of myopia, and to a certain extent, maybe progression. And for people who are already myopic, we need to look at how we reduce the progression of myopia because it leads to further, uh, the progression leads to more and more complications in the eye. So the health policy that we are going to look at needs to be holistic in its approach and should cover all the ab above uh, points mentioned. 
just to look at some of the countries we, which already have health policies in place, we have Singapore, Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan. Uh, the paper here is an example uh, of how Singapore has gone ahead uh, in its uh, health policy towards myopia. So they have a national myopia prevention program which was started in 2001. Uh, this uh, is basically a complete approach in terms of um, you know, providing brochures, assisting the parents, uh, involving the teachers in schools, uh, and many uh, other ways in which they are trying to uh, control my myopia as an epidemic. One of them is uh, this uh, Fit Sight uh, watch, which is similar to Fitbit, which Pawan did uh, speak about. So it has a light sensor and it's connected to an app. So at the end of the day, you can see uh, the amount of uh, time the kid has spent uh, outdoors and the feedback goes to both the, the person who is wearing it, that's the kid, as well as the parent. And uh, the government has given certain norms in terms of how many hours. And if they fall short during the week, then the parents are encouraged to try and make up for the same amount of time outdoors during the weekends as well. And as uh, far as the ministry's government approach is concerned, uh, they have a lot of health promotion talks, uh, brochures, and they have a lot of information in their websites as well. And they also arrange outdoor activities in terms of with visiting national parks and so on during the weekends. And the location is uh, done on a rotation uh, basis so that the kids do not get bored. Uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, they have a lot of ministries which are working in collaboration, the Educational Ministry, the National Health Commission, and many other departments uh, which, are, uh, which have come together. And uh, they basically tell parents uh, uh, that the kids need to spend time more outdoors. And also in their educational policy, they try and give uh, very less kind of uh, written work for small kids like, uh, you know, pre-KG -pre and KG and the first and second standard kids, they try and give less and less of uh, writing homework so that near work is reduced. And the parents are also advised to refrain from um, any kind of gadgets for their uh, kids. Uh, this is something that Pawan already alluded to in terms of the distance to be maintained in schools. They've also gone ahead uh, of late uh, to look at more of sunlight exposure in classrooms. So they have something called as a sunroof, which now you, know, you can see in many houses also that they have sunroofs to bring in sunlight. So similar kind of classrooms have been designed uh, in China as well. And uh, they also have a device that's clipped onto the uh, spectacle frame of the children, which measures what distance they use their reading material, whether they are uh, spending more and more time in gadgets. And if it is a gadget, what kind and what kind of fonts and so on. So uh, it gives a lot of information to uh, assess the nature of their near work, the kids near work. And once that is done, then uh, that data goes to the eye care practitioner. Now coming to the Indian scenario, uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, these um, teaching apps now, which are on gadgets, uh, unfortunately, and more and more being used now because of uh, COVID. We also are now shifting from outdoor sports to these sports coming into these gadgets, which is actually a, a bad sign as far as myopia is concerned, where we are advocating the kids to go out and play more and more. Now, all these uh, apps are coming on to these gadgets, which is uh, making them even more addictive as far as the uh, sports is concerned with the gadgets. Uh, just to share some data in 2019, internet, the number of international schools were around 708. Uh, I think by now they've also increased the reason I put that data is because uh, compared to normal schools, international schools use more of uh, gadget related educational uh, material. So everything comes uh, on the phone and so on. Now, of course, because of COVID, all the schools kind of have moved to the scenario, which is quite alarming as far as myopia is concerned. So the picture says it all here. Basically, uh, because of COVID, all of us have moved to more and more uh, online education. So just uh, a few activities that OCI has done uh, till now is we've uh, kind of covered 410 government schools where we've uh, presented with the posters and information uh, in uh, around um, nine different languages, Indian languages in government schools. And uh, we kind of said that each class would be responsible for one poster so that it doesn't get damaged and also presentation to educate both the students as well as the uh, teachers with regards to myopia and other eye conditions. And during the pandemic, we did uh, 
do some uh, awareness initiatives. But all of this is such a, uh, you know, minuscule when you look at the huge, huge problem that we have. So definitely advocacy of this problem is, is the key and we need to look at uh, health policy changes as far as eye care towards myopia is concerned. So we need to involve uh, uh, eye care providers, governments, parents, teachers, and as a team, as Yeshwan said, it's a whole team that needs to work if we need to really, uh, you know, reduce the uh, the percentages that Pawan was talking about. Uh, I do get, uh, you know, um, people asking, or oh, do you mean that if, if classrooms are outdoors, we'll be going back to our old school of thought of Gurukul and all of that and well, why do we have technology nowadays? Well, uh, I, I try and say that, you know, technology, nobody is stopping technology being used uh, underneath the, uh, you know, a, a, a tree when we have outdoor classrooms. So you, you need to take best of both worlds and then bring them together. So there's nothing wrong in holding a few classes uh, outdoors if the school has uh, that kind of premises. Uh, we can you know, always say that few classes can be held uh, outdoors in uh, sunlight as well. So as uh, OCI, we did come up as a, just for a start, as I said, this uh, is such a minuscule effort compared to the a huge problem that we have in front of us. So we came up with this white paper document uh, and it's been drafted by the people that I mentioned. And uh, we were very, very thankful that so many organizations, local associations and international organization did endorse uh, our efforts. And uh, uh, recently WCO is also coming up with a resolution in terms of how to manage myopia and uh, OCI being a member of WCO, we would also be signing such a resolution shortly. Uh, in terms of advocacy of myopia management among the eye care professions itself. So what does the white paper consist of? It consists of recommendations for schools, for eye examination, uh, in terms of healthcare policies and slight, uh, some other recommendations as well. So for the schools, uh, we are saying that they should have one hour compulsory outdoor activity. Uh, they should have uh, a little bit of spacious uh, playgrounds uh, and the new upcoming schools, uh, when they're constructing, they should have uh, windows and, you know, they should be constructed in such a way that it allows ample amount of sunlight to enter into the uh, class. And for small kids, we uh, try and do more of activity-based education rather than books or, you know, some near work related activities. As far as eye examination goes, we have said that people who are wearing spectacles need eye examination every six months. Uh, in case parents are uh, myopic, which is uh, de definitely a, a you know, precursor for the kid to develop myopia, then the teachers should recommend eye examination for those kind of uh, children. And the other children who do not wear spectacles or who, do not, or who are not myopic, they should be examined every year as well. And in case of online classes that is there now, after every year, give us slight break so that the, you know, the kid gets away from near work and looks at something uh, distance according to the 2020-20 rule. And uh, recommendations for, uh, you know, the, uh, the education point of view is more of awareness among the parents and of the importance of myopia and what myopia progression can do as far as eye health is concerned, involving the teachers as uh, key stakeholders because they are in constant, uh, you know, a communication with the students and uh, also giving the schools as well as the students some kind of awareness uh, material. Other recommendations is for the entire holistic development of uh, all these uh, that, that, that have been mentioned. You need to have uh, some kind of a special interest group uh, with working with the government as well as the educational ministry to come up with all these uh, policies and the implementation of the same, as well as have some kind of community activity maybe over the weekends for all the children in small, small uh, communities over the weekend outdoor activities so that they are exposed to uh, sunlight. So this in a nutshell is what we have uh, recommended and uh, we hope uh, we have we have sent this document to uh, the government officials as well and we hope to work with them uh, regards this in the near future as well. So um, that comes to the end of uh, the talk. So thank you so much uh, all the speakers. Uh, Dr. Pawan, Dr. Vishnadhan, um, Ashwant, and uh, Lakshmi uh, for a very you know excellent presentation. And uh, thanks to all the participants who really made uh, part of this uh, discussion with uh, very good questions, very relevant. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.